It is April the 8th, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Hello, welcome back. I'm Chris. This is the future of photography. With me are Adrian and Jeremiah. Hello. Hello. Ha! Ah, Easter weekend. Easter weekend. Do you guys yes. celebrate that? Only we in the chocolate egg sense. Only, yeah. <laughs> yeah only, only in the fact that I didn't, don't, didn't have to shoot yesterday, so that's good. Oh, you had a day off. Okay. Yeah. Any, any, any Easter, Easter photography things? Or is, is Easter in any way related to photography? Not really, right? AI, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking some, some, uh, some holidays. Kids with mucky faces, I think, possibly. Yeah, yeah. chocolate around the... Yeah, yeah, mouth. that sort okay. of, that sort of thing, definitely. Um, and in the UK, it's the sort of you never know whether it's going to be snowing or nice and sunny at Easter. Um, today is a proper mm. springtime day. Actually, it's been quite nice outside, but it's going to the temperature is going to drop as soon as the sun goes down. So. All right. We have, well, <laughs> Jeremiah has proposed a topic <laughs> and we, we don't really have a good it's plan a surprise on how to approach topic, it. It's, a, it's of, a surprise topic. So why it don't really, you start it, it, this off? It really comes from, well, what is our process in protecting our legacy photographs digitally? We all understand that if we have negatives, we can store them right. We can put them in a box. We can put them in a well. You know, a nice there's cool plenty, plenty of mistakes you can do there as well. So it's I wouldn't. True, true. Yeah. You could, you know, boil them in water. You can keep them exposed <laughs> to UV light. You can throw them in a scrapbook unprotected by glassine or plastic. Yeah, there's right. lots of ways to ruin your negatives. That's for sure. But when it comes to digital we think oh great you know we have our hard drives we and we have our formats and we just assume that those formats are going to be with us forever and a day and the life of our children and grandchildren etc um, and that our operating systems within our computers and hard drives will forever be operating just as they are today but i don't think that's the case Hashtag floppy disks. Uh, zip drive. How about zip drive? Zip drive. Have <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember those. Yes, of course you remember them. How many photographs do you have on your zip drive? <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> Try to get a reader. Uh, the, the, the point of this um, intro is to say we take our formats much for granted here. Um, what, you know, the most common, I think, for photographers is JPEG. Um, though we want to talk about TIFF, and DNG, and PSD, and the new Apple format, eight, you know, what's it called? HC, uh, HCIC? Heath, 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 or yeah. High Efficiency Image Codec, Heath. There you go. <laughs> so, and on and on and on, and of course, <clears throat> new ones come up every decade, and they all claim to be the answer for storage quality, uh, recovery, etc. Uh, not really the case. So I, I thought it would be interesting to just talk about the future of how we protect the legacy of our images and do we need to keep converting them? What is the process in terms of hardware and software, i.e. formats, in terms of making sure that our photographs will remain uh, visible for many, many years to come? Um, uh, several years ago, uh, when I was thinking about digitizing my negatives and storing them, um, I, I started to do some research on what is the best way to do it. And there's a company, I think it's called Iron Mountain here. And Iron Mountain, what they do is they, uh, they will take your digitized work uh, and they will um, keep it in a redundant fashion. Generally, they are responsible for things like government and hospital records. So there's a constant reconversion of new technologies. They keep it all very safe um, in several different locations globally uh, for recovery. And so I said, uh, I have less than a terabyte. What would it cost to store it? And they went, oh, you know, about $25,000. 
Whoa, I said. Then they went, a month. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bargain. That's a bargain. <laughs> of course, if you don't pay, boom, um, it's gone, right? So I think it would um, be cheaper to just have yourself cryogenically frozen. Right? Maybe, yes. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> So or just it's, give it's, up. it's an give interesting up. topic, this, isn't it? Because it's not the, I mean, we, we, we all, all of us who are interested in photography circle back around to this. And I'm pretty confident it's not the first time we've had this discussion on this podcast. But I might have had an event since the last time we discussed it on this podcast. And so I have a bit of an angle on this that I, I you know, keen to get you guys, your, your opinion. Because the th my, my event was that I went to look at some old raw files and could not open them. Oops. Now, how, how did is, that go? Well, so, so how that goes. So as you know, I, most of my photo management, I use, uh, Apple photos for, um, uh, and Apple Fo Apple photos works off their own set of raw decryption or raw interpretation codex, right? They have a library. It's built into Mac OS. It's built into o iOS, um, and it seems that they might have, what's the, is the word, deprecated? I'm not quite sure. T t yeah. taken, taken off the end of the list some of the really old ones. So a little while ago when I went to open some raw files from uh, a Nikon camera I had in the late 2000s, uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, decrypt the code, uh, the, the raw files. It would only give me the embedded JPEG. So... That was interesting because what that led me to a thought was actually, you know, we always talk, everybody always says, oh, JPEGs aren't going to last forever. But I don't know of a service that doesn't support JPEGs. But if there are certain services now that are not, that, that are deprecating older raw files, then that's a really challenging thing because you never might, you, you might not know when it's going to happen to you. And if the answer is, oh, well, you have to pay a high subscription rate to one of the companies that does maintain the list and the codex, you know, like, uh, for example, Capture One or Adobe or somebody else. Yeah, it's, it's that, you know, is there, so, so my concern is that perhaps we might all end up being hostage to fortune for our raw files to well, a subscription company. The, the thing is, um, you say, you say JPEG, or what I hear is you, you say JPEG feels safer than raw, which might be real because raw is, Ross change and the companies update them with features and stuff, but JPEG is just thirty years old, and in yeah. there's 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 plugs and things for computers that have lasted twenty years and shorter. So a thirty year old file format, I wouldn't bet on JPEG being around in thirty years from now. No, I think it's actually worse than that. I mean, I think we are probably, generationally speaking one of the most uh, documented generation in the world. I mean, the amount of photographs that are taken daily to record daily life or international life or uh, cultural life is just overwhelming. Uh, and yet most, if not all currently, are stored pretty much on hard drives. And, and in the event of you know, a black swan event, an EMP failure of, of drive, some, uh, you know, odd um, kind of technical disease that infiltrates through could end up wiping out most of our recorded history currently, unlike, you know, 100 years ago, where it's pretty well preserved, um, as, you know, one might think in terms of... well. I just just over Christmas I had this project where I digitized uh, I talked about here where I digitized the 100 year old photos from uh, from a part of my family which were on glass plates they were just fine yeah. they were super easy to read and and take care of uh, I know an archivist archivist mm -hmm. is that the term who, yep. Yep. who's who's um, who who told me that this the last 100 years will or the last 50 years will probably be the least well-documented um, generation ever. But with a lot of documentation up front, as in there's so many photos now, millions, billions of photos every day, I guess, and uh, we end up with um, the, the chance of 
losing a lot of that because yes, of and, the way we yeah, store it, things. Yeah, it becomes an analog digital conversation uh, in terms of longevity, and 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 that's what provoked my thinking in terms of formats and our dependence uh, on formats because most of the times you pointed out, Adrian, you know, are we going to be held hostage uh, to pay for our legacy? Um, you know, yes, uh, in my, you know, this is probably going back a decade or two in terms of preservation. But, you know, um, I started to interview some people from MIT and, you know, globally, just hunting down what would be if I wanted to preserve a photograph in perpetuity, what would I do? And uh, the bottom line is, you know, most people agreed that printing and storage would be the best way to do it. You print your photograph <laughs> carefully, you archive it, and you put it away. But maybe that only lasts 200 years anyway. So I said, you, you going in California, on? Jeremiah, if your whole country doesn't sink into the sea at some point, it's just going to burn. <laughs> Right. <laughs> from within or without, I don't know, but but the odds are not good looking. No, right they're not. Now. No, 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 absolutely. Um, but but it's interesting, and don't laugh when I tell you what the the um, ultimate way to preserve a single image, and that was to break it down into ones and zeros, and etch it on a titanium plate. Uh, with instructions on how to reconstruct those ones and zeros into an actual image. Or you could Who put has it on done a gold, you have you a gold done record. I have not done this. <laughs> yeah, one of one of those this. one of those gold plates that they sent out with Voyager. To space, you know, Voyager, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Ah. Um, so uh, I thought that that discussing the advantages of kind of legacy formats i.e. very popular formats versus uh, highly tuned formats like, say, a DNG, which is basically controlled by Adobe. And they've done a pretty good job, but, you know, there's nothing to say that Adobe won't exist in 10 years, 50 years. Who knows? What do we do with those things? How do we make sure that um, our, our legacy is protected and under what circumstances. I, I did an experiment before I left here for location, and I think I may have mentioned it, where I did make a archival uh, Lightflex print, black and white print from one of my digital creations. And even then, it's a stunning, um, you know, continuous tone image, and it is archival, which means it is expected under, you know, the right preservation uh, to last over or around 200 years. Yeah. You know, so, that, and that's, that's going back to effectively traditional photography processing in chemicals and washing it out and being very careful with it. Um, those are not, <laughs> obviously, they're not cheap to do, converting digital to analog. Uh, years ago, I did a... Uh, an experiment where I took digital imagery, this is going way back to some of the first digital images I did, converting it to four by five negatives and then preserving them. Those negatives look fantastic today and they print very, very, very well. Uh, but again, those are not practical. Um, so these, these are really interesting questions for people who do want to preserve their family photos or archivists who want to preserve um, collections of imagery by great artists, photographers, uh, image makers, whether it's Magnum or, you know, your buddy down the street. How do we make sure that in two, three, four hundred years there is a record of what it is we observed and not... You know, not to be kind of too um, AI about it, but uh, Midjourney uh, has just created something called Describe. I don't know if you're, it is absolutely mind blowing. You just feed in a picture, it, it, I it have turns a, it into text and recreates a version of this. I have, a, I have something to say about Describe, but let's put this at the end <laughs> of this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so okay. there's, 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 
I, I, when when considering this question, I, I love to go back to first principles and challenge us all, right? And I'm challenging myself as well as, as anybody else out there. Is there not, for example, a, a large slice of ego in underlying this question? Yeah, you mean do we really need to preserve photos? So, 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 the, well, we do, do we need do we really need to preserve our photos? Perhaps right, because yeah, yes, many photos will be lost, but of the you know uh, of the billions and billions of photos that are taken every day, very few of them constitute part of a meaningful historical record. Right. But who decides well, that? Do you decide yes, that, that, or do I, the people I, I, in five hundred years decide? I that? throw so, down the gauntlet of that. I so, but, okay, but but so so if if we take if I if I go on a walk with my family and I take a hundred photos on that walk, maybe one or two of them might be relevant, and it, it almost doesn't matter which one or two, does it? Because yeah, if if what you're thinking thinking from the point of view of a, a future. Uh, as the, the the phrase that Chris likes to use, the photo archaeologist, right? If you are a future photo archaeologist, um, uh, is it important to you to see a hundred pictures of my walk? Or is my it answer important? is yes. Yes, yes, one hundred percent. Yes, <laughs> it is because it. By the way, because it it is a non-binary choice here. Um, it, you're saying that of the hundred, maybe one will survive, and I'm saying that. If if one doesn't survive, all the hundred won't survive. No, no, They're I'm not all... saying which ones will survive and which ones won't. What I'm saying it, is it, that it, what it, I'm saying is that regardless of which ones survive, you know, one would be sufficient to tell the story. That may um, be. Tr that no. may. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's just assume. Let's just, Chris. Let's just give him that and assume that that one is worth all the hundred. Right. Let's just assume that, which I do not agree with, but but let's just assume why would that one out of that, you know, hundred survive? Because, again, we're talking about formats. So if this is all, you know, if you have preserved all these 100 on a hard drive with DNG and, you know, in. 30 years, DNG is like, well, we don't do that format anymore. All of your images will be impossible to recover. Your children will not be able to recover. Let me, let me address the why for just a brief second here. Why would we even want these pictures, the snapshots that we took on that walk for 400 years ago? Why would we want those preserved? Um, and so I'm very, very sorry and have to apologize, but we'll briefly have to brush AI again because, of course, that imagery is going to be training data to be able to recreate this time in a yeah. virtual context. They've already done yeah. that. The, the, the model's already trained on all those images already. So that, oh, that, well, we're, we're only but, at but the baby steps of this. Exactly. You know? We're just early in that process. So if in 500 years some archaeologists don't want to have to rely on digging up stuff that's half a meter deep in the ground, but they want to relive the time in, in an as real as possible fashion, then they need some model that is trained on what's available and every bit counts just one single photo might recreate that in your mind because you've been there and so on but someone in the future will need all the information they they can get and feed into the machine this is yeah, that's I, a very human centric view chris uh, is it when, well, our, when our robot overlords are actually running the place <laughs> in 400 years time from well now, they, no, they, they may care, be our ally. But... They may be our allies at that point because I know, prefer I think the... to go the utopian route me, there, right? Yeah, I, I, I would say that if you just for a, you know a thought experiment here, if every image in the entire world every day was part of a training model on some supercomputer. Uh, quantum computing, and was able to recreate, and that's why I brought up Midjourney Describe, in my view, there would be the potential to really describe in virtual reality a way to really see in absolute detail what it was like to go on your oh. walk. To see, to feel, to smell, to yeah. whatever, 400 years from now? 
Yeah. Come on, the, the, the speed of change that we're seeing right now. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, it, it brings me back to it brings me back to ego, right? Which is, you know, there, there are some things that are important culturally and for our society, but not everything that everybody does every day is important for our culture or for our society. But who decides? I, I would say well, that sometimes the most mundane images us, of two hundred years <laughs> ago. Like, you know, you look at uh, Nieps or, or, or Daguerre or some of these very, very early images taken through a window of a, of a street in Paris, and, and you think, oh, my God, that is so fascinating, shot in 1822. It is, you know, and that, that guy is... still having his boots polished. But the, 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 the <laughs> thing is, right, the, the, but, and, and that is a culturally significant thing. It was, it was the dawn of a new way of image making. It was a new art form. It was a new technology. And it has had a long-lasting cultural impact. The fact that today I had to do some DIY in my home does not have a long-lasting cultural impact. I disagree. I, th I, think, I think that's I a very do. egoistic view of the world, that the world doesn't deserve to have these things preserved for the <laughs> yes, next that's right. years. You're, you're beating yourself up, Adrian. <laughs> you're discounting your importance in the world yes, you are. and its history. <laughs> <laughs> let's go yeah. back to tech. Okay, let's, okay. Let's, back, let's, back to tech. Okay, back so to tech. So... Let's make a decision here. Let me let me run you through my process because okay. I do have an ego and I want some of my stuff preserved at least as long as I live because I want access to it. And that is a very important thing if I want to, I don't know, write another book and try to find uh, pictures in my in my archive and so on. So I need I need just just from a very egoistic point of view, I need those pictures or I feel I might need them sometime in the future. So I need to be able to find them which means I'll, I'll have to have some metadata there so I can type in some location or some date and, and dig out, do my own uh, archaeology and my own photography, which is, I don't know, 100,000 or more pictures. So, um, and it keeps growing. So, so uh, first of all, I need some metadata, some organization. Then I need the tech in terms of the hardware to keep that available um i do need some redundancy which i do have because i back them up to other media physical media there's also a cloud component i have several terabytes of stuff in the cloud that gets backed up there and updated on a nightly basis um so that worst case the house burns down or something um i will still be able to uh, retrieve that in terms of formats I am currently still relying on RAW. The, ma the majority of my catalog is in RAW, in several different RAW formats over the years. And uh, the thing I do, not like religiously, but at least twice a year, I will go into some of the older pictures and do a little spot check and see if they can still be read by Lightroom, which is still my tool of choice, which won't be around forever. But I know that these can be read. I know that these can if need be, convert it to DNG or to TIFF. TIFF is, I think, the oldest high-quality uh, photo format that has a very long legacy. And my, my, my scans of, uh, of film pictures are all in TIFF. And I have good hope that those will outlive me. Um, but... I do regularly, once a year, twice a year, have a look at the older pictures to <laughs> trust, to get, but verify. <laughs> trust, but 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 every now and then verify just to make sure that these uh, pictures are still going yeah. to be accessible. And yeah, the the metadata are part of this this weird blob of a Lightroom catalog. So. Um, some of that is on the disk in XMP files, um, but not very reliably. So I might lose some metadata in, a, in the worst possible accident, but I will not lose the pictures. And yeah, that's I mean, my personal my, protection plan. My, my protection is almost identical to yours. In fact, it is identical to yours in terms of what, what uh, software I use, Lightroom, to organize. Uh, certainly, uh, TIFF is my um, format of choice. Just because, and they can stable. be awfully large. These TIFF files, very large, 50, yeah. 50, 60, 75 for an image is not unusual. So, yeah. 
it put constraint on on hardware. My, I think the biggest um, fear I have is really in the hardware more, more than the software because software often uh, can be uh, recoded. Um, there are services that will do that. Uh, I, you know, recently had a bunch of very old formats and in, in uh, film film ones and and. Um, I found a place in Hollywood, of course, that you know works with studios and whatnot. You just brought up a whole pile of stuff to them. It wasn't even that expensive. They have all those machines. They keep them running beautifully, and they update the software or not. Sometimes they just make sure that they have the legacy operating systems for that, and the conversions are really good, and then they make a conversion. But you know, I'm in Hollywood. This is you know one of the yeah. Hollywood of the seems world. to be the right place for these to, for these things to be available right around the corner. Well, certainly, if a studio is preserving a, a you know a film, what do they do? Um, and I you know I have uh, experience with this because uh, you know my um, my first movie um, was uh, you know rebuilt by Warner Brothers uh, or late last year, mid last year. And, you know, they basically went into their archive. They pulled out the original negative. They, they cleaned it frame by frame. They rescanned it frame by frame in 4K. They pulled out, of course, all of the, um, the sound, um, you know what I mean? And, and, and kind of rebuilt that and we remixed it and recolored it. And, um, and that is the 4K version. When they really get very serious about preservation, and that's the Library of Congress, they will take the original negative and they will make color separations of them and keep those color separations, you know, even on digital. Because those digital formats uh, to keep converting all of the outtakes, all of the bins, the unused material, uh, I heard costs of like a million dollars of film just, just to keep them active, unlike the way it used to be, where they just throw it in a, a can and hope the nitrate doesn't <laughs> explode. Um, but, uh, you know, the more stable backs uh, have worked very, very well if they're, they're properly conditioned. And, but, you know, breaking it down into black and white archival, beautifully preserved um, scans gives them the, and kept in some mountain, uh, fortress uh, gives, and this these this is their you know their library. This is their asset. It's like gold to them. They cannot afford to lose these things. So they're very advanced in in preservation. And also you have people like Scorsese and and a lot of others who are, you know create uh, foundations in order to preserve films that will be lost or are in the process of deteriorating. Um, I think in in Photography, uh, there is no one place to go to. Certainly, if I give my all my assets to the Library of Congress, uh, they would do that. You know what I mean? Because um, there's a reasonably good um, bet that Library of Congress will still be around <laughs> as long as the country is around. Not only bets on <laughs> how long the country is going to be around, but. But within the country, Library of Congress does a very, very good job of it because that's their that is their mandate, you know, create a kind of uh, national, you know, um, archive for what they consider culturally important things. What does an individual do? Is there a um, is there a company? Is there an organization? Is there a foundation that will do that for one's uh, personal format? I, I mean, I've never found one, but I think these are important things for humanity and to decide on a format. What is that format and how are those legacy uh, images uh, converted and, you know, protected and, and you know, um, kept uh, for perpetuity? Um, because I think that's important. All of it is very, very important. For history, you know, they you have to you have to look back at history to understand where we've come from and where we're going, and and so I I, I think these are very very important things. Now we could also talk about what are the advantages of JPEG over TIFF, TIFF over DNG, DNG over PSD, 
etc., etc., because each of them have a different short or long-term interest for us. Yeah, and we don't have three hours for an episode. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we talk about some attributes, though? Because going back to my original issue, right, the one of the concerns that I have is that you get locked into a paid subscription for a service to keep yes. your archive alive. Whether it's twenty five thousand dollars a month, or whether it's <laughs> whether it's five ninety nine from Google, it, it, um, it, the the concern that I have is is that you end up locked into something that you don't want to be locked into. I have an example of that as well. We have a, a Flickr feed uh, that we, we used to use daily when the children were toddlers, and Flickr allowed you to upload a photo, put in a title, and put in a, a slightly longer description. Now, Flickr have made some uh, some good steps forward in allowing you to download those, um, but you can only download, what they do is they put the title of your image as the title in the EXIF data, and they will download you a whole pile of JPEGs. You can download your whole of your Flickr account, and it'll have all the titles. If you ever use that description field, it is much more difficult. Now, they will absolutely provide you with all the information. This is not against Flickr in any way, shape, or form. I think they're actually doing okay. Um, but they will provide you all of that metadata, but they provide you in a JSON file, which you then need to be able to process in some way to rebuild your archive outside of Flickr, which most people, um, most people probably listening to this podcast won't know what a JSON file is, let alone be able to, to build a software process to, to pass that information. So the, yeah, my concern is, is about being locked into stuff. So my my gut feel for the answer to this is some level of open source initiative to a standard uh, and maybe maybe TIFF is a good starting point as a standard. I don't know who owns the format, but uh, but but yeah, maybe it's a foundation that is 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 happy to share it like you know, JPEG is a format. I don't think you have to pay to use the JPEG format, do you in any way, shape or form? So maybe we need a high quality certainly not an 8-bit format, but maybe we need a high-quality file format that is backed by an open standard and therefore would have some longevity and also would not be locked behind a paywall. Can I throw a question at you? <clears throat> would you say, given the popularity and use of JPEG, which um, for those uh, uh, you know listening or watching... You know, we, we pretty well agree that JPEG is probably the lowest in terms of quality. Um, and there's, you know, we could talk about why. Um, and let's just say that uh, TIFF currently is one of the highest. Um, but also, if it depends on your use case. I mean, PSD is really, really good if you're moving in and out of the Adobe world um, to preserve layers uh, on photographs that are non-destructive to be able to go in and just work with a certain layer as technology becomes more available or less available. One has that opportunity. DNG is good because it's supposed to be universal, though it is very specifically um, attuned uh, to, um, you know, to a company, effectively. Um, so all of these have advantages, and I think would it, the question I'm, I'm going to throw out is, is it just best if we just say we can preserve most of the images using JPEG because it doesn't take that much space, it's not best quality, but because most people are using it, let's go with that um, and make sure. And that's kind of how it's been for the last, I don't know, 40 years. Um, rather than kind of putting all our eggs in a high quality format raw. You know, raw is the thing that I use uh, a lot, but it gives me a lot of uh, nervous nights because I too have, have experienced the changes in raw formats. I mean, raw is great if you just go, raw is a universal but it's not. I mean, that's what DNG is supposed to be, right? A conversion from a basic raw to something that is kind of at the center of a hub that you could spoke out for other uh, formats. But but the decision really, there's a decision uh, personally for your family, and there's a decision socially and culturally of w what should the, you know, what should the 
global archive be? And I, they, they're not necessarily the same thing because of the amount of space required. Yeah, um, ab- and, ab- absolutely. And so so on, the, on the raw th- the raw thing is interesting because it, every time you open a raw file, you're converting it. And depending on which software you use or which version of which software you use, you'll get a different end result every time you open the file. So, yeah, being a Fuji shooter, um, you know, in the early days of the X-Trans sensors, there was a lot of talk, there's less so, but still some today, about which raw converters are the best converters for Fuji X-Trans images. Often people uh, cite Capture One as a really good tool for that. It's not a tool I've used, so I can't comment from, from first experience. But I think the, 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 and equally JPEG has its limits because it's, it's, it is a low quality file format. So I, I can imagine, though, that um, the, that over time there will emerge a new format. I know many people have tried that is a, that is a reasonably um, affordable format in the sense that it doesn't take up too much space and it doesn't come with a license attached to it and things like that, that actually many perhaps cloud backup companies might work towards. So Apple are having a go with their high-efficiency codecs uh, and I don't know what Apple do with the photos that I upload to iCloud. I don't know how they store them. Um, I know they must store they must store the raw files because they wouldn't be able to recreate those very easily. Um, but what, what they whether they convert or store JPEGs or high efficiency files, how they do that, who knows? Who cares? To be honest, as long as they. And so I I, I live in in my utopian world. world um, your th- there will emerge two things. There will emerge a class of file that is affordable and good quality, and there will emerge a class of cloud provider that will just do what they need to do to maintain your archive. And you can pay them to maintain your archive. Uh, for me, you know, looking in terms of consumer tooling and consumer subscriptions and stuff like that, you know, ten or a month or less. I think I pay Apple seven pounds a month for my two terabytes of backup, which I don't mind doing. So, briefly back to Tiff and DNG. Both <laughs> are owned by Adobe. Oh, TIFF is owned um, by Adobe as well. Tiff so is, I, mean, DNG, yes, I didn't Tiff, know TIFF was owned by Adobe. TIFF is owned by Adobe. I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, quickly find licensing information, but DNG um, is based on TIFF. Uh, Adobe, uh, Wikipedia says Adobe has published a license allowing anyone to exploit DNG and has also stated that there are no known intellectual property encumbrances or license requirements okay. for DNG. So they pretty much license this into the open and that but not has, the code uh, but it's not open source um it's not i don't think it's open source but and no. it does have extensions uh, specific to manufacturers but at least um it seems that institutional uh in institutional settings uh, dng has been mainly and widely adopted for archival purposes i think i've got the answer so. i think we just have to nationalize adobe <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. It's going to be popular. <laughs> I don't but know. Is I mean, that, some, I, is that something that happens in, in the USA? I don't know, right? Adobe's an American <laughs> company, right? Here in the UK, every 50 years or so, we nationalize a bunch of stuff. It's the railways <laughs> are coming around next. They're going to nationalize the railways in the next 10 years or so back in, in the UK again. <laughs> um, okay. So, for fun. For fun. Let's, let's, I, I, I don't think we'll, we'll have a final I don't think answer. We'll sol- but I, I don't think we'll solve it, but, you know, I'll leave us with a little dystopian um, fragment to ponder. Is uh, Given that it is uh, an Adobe format, what if another country basically said, no, it, we're banning all uses of TIFF, DNG, etc. You can't use it in our country. I wouldn't be surprised if there were countries already that did that. It'd be Italy, wouldn't it? Let's face it. What they <laughs> to this week. It'd be Italy. <laughs> Probably. Ah, gentlemen, how about some picks of the week? Uh, Jeremiah, I still don't see yours here popping up, so we'll start uh, with sure. um, Adrian's no, well, first. And you can, well, mine you can is send- pick of the week, and for, the, and for those watching on YouTube, it's also a show and tell, right? So I shall hold this up to the camera right now. There we go. Look at that. So um, my pick of the week this week, um, broadly speaking, is camera accessories, right? Never, never fall into the trap of thinking that, that, you know, that buying the camera is the only thing. There's so much fun to be had in accessories. And my accessory of the week, which I've been using all week and enjoying, is 
Well, I won't read out the number. It's the fisheye converter uh, from Olympus for my little Olympus TUF camera, um, which I uh, I got out of the drawer. I hadn't used it for a little while. I got it out of the drawer this week because I felt like taking some really wide angle. It's not really a fisheye lens. It's a, it's it's more a sort of uh, deliberately dis slightly distorted super wide angle lens. Um, and uh it's just fun right and it just gives you a different perspective uh literally quite i suppose a different perspective uh and i that's my pick of the week accessories everybody go out and accessorize this this reminds me of um oh many years ago i had a dv uh camera and of course they didn't have uh interchangeable lenses so i had to have an external uh wide angle converter on that and it uh it changed everything. It made it really versatile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there's, uh, loads of, there's loads of good stuff out there for whatever camera you've got. Has anybody ever used those big wide angles for your iPhone that kind of screw on or fit on? I have the original moment lenses. The, the very yeah. original <laughs> moment mount. So it doesn't work anymore because they changed the mount, didn't they? But I had go. an early Oloclip, which oh, yeah. um, was... I've, I never really used it because it was yeah. always somewhere in a pocket in a different pocket that i didn't have with me so you should have my pick in your email by the way okay yeah. i will i will be checking my email in a second uh, until then let's have a quick look at my pick of the week which is kind of an yeah it's it's not really a pick it's more an anti-pick i don't know i'm not sure how to what to think about this it's uh, <laughs> Levi Strauss and Co. who have now officially declared that they will be using AI-generated models to increase diversity. That's their claim. So they are um, they are going to they're partnering <laughs> with a company called LalaLand.ai, yes, who is virtual a specialized modeling agency. Virtual modeling agency. They are pretty much uh, specialized on the fashion industry. Just, they, so, just skipping back to that website you showed there very briefly, Chris. Um, I'm not sure I believe the diversity line because although they may be AI generated not. models, they're they're all skinny, beautiful women. Uh, so, it, so, well, no, I think it goes beyond that. They're actually not women at all. Okay, <laughs> exactly, yeah, they're point. bits and bytes. <laughs> <laughs> they're just ones and zeros. So they're the thing presenting is, presenting true diversity where you actually have to pay a human of, to of represent. Course, of course, this is it's obviously comes from the saving time and money uh, perspective because they yeah. will now not have to hire models, not have to hire photographers, not have to build sets. They can just uh, create La La Land AI. If you go to the website, they claim you can uh, create your own model for in five minutes. So they can yeah. have a whole bunch of different models, uh, probably some sliders to change the size how of the they, eyes and how whatever. How do they do the clothing now? Oh, easily. well, and then you have uh, you have uh, you, there, there will certainly be some formats that uh, you save those in, li like CAD kind of stuff, and then yeah, uh, the the properties, and then you can uh, it goes it goes beyond that. It goes into production because you don't have to produce prototypes anymore, at least not as many, because you can you can try your dress on twenty different body types just with a well, you, click of a button. The the Pope wearing a Balenciaga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. That's a perfect yeah. example. <clears throat> that's of... a good example. And of course, if we if you look even further with all our, our devices having uh, neural uh, yeah. chips in them, sooner or later you'll have your like your own body avatar and you can shop clothes yeah, by glasses. looking at yourself on the screen. Sure. Um, Eyeglasses, they do it all the time now, yeah. right? You can try on different glasses. And so I, th like. I think, I think that's where ears. this is coming from. And <laughs> Sorry? And cat ears. So you can try cat ears on virtually in loads of different apps. <laughs> Same thing. Or put glasses on cats too. You can <laughs> do all of that. Hmm. All um, right. <laughs> Let's open Jeremiah's email. Here we go. Oh, what is that? Glasses? Yeah, this is this is the, basically one of the first real, I mean, they this claim because I don't think it's completely out yet, but uh, they this is the the kind of AR VR, you know, huge screen, 215 inches wide when you look at it. Uh, they claim to use OLED technology, so it should be very very sharp. 
Um, this is the, you know, basically you sit back uh, and you look at, there's your image, you know, a huge screen, perfectly sharp, big refresh rate, OLED, amazing sound. Uh, there you go. Um, and this is the beginning of, of what we could possibly see coming forward with Apple, though. I'm not convinced that this is a technology that will be widely embraced. I know not that yet, we've not initially. To, yeah, we've talked about this, and I think you know everyone knows. You know, I, I do like to be an early adopter, and I know <laughs> certainly Chris does. Adrian, uh, not so sure about that, but he'd probably go with the old specs. But um, I'm picky. I'm picky. I, I do like to ad uh, yeah, to be an early adopter, but only in a picky way. So yeah, this, this even even for someone like myself, I, I think that. Um, you know, I've I've heard some very astute commentators uh, describe this technology as if you wear it, uh, you will never find a mate. Yes. Yeah, well, there's probably okay. probably something like that. Do you know what? They, but in in my life, something like that could be really useful. So one of the things that I persist on, uh, I, and I know why it's it, it's capital e, capitalist economics, but one of the things I find incredibly frustrating is that when I travel, I still have to carry a computer, even when I have a phone in my pocket. And you know, the the, the phone in my pocket is perfectly powerful enough for all the computing that I need to do. And yet, and, and especially this is true for, for, for when I'm working, when I travel, I have to carry a computer with me. So I, it's, it's just such an archaic way of working when, uh, but as, and yeah, I know the reason, right? It's, it's economics, yeah? People want to sell you more than one product. And as I sit here in my house, which is practically littered with Apple products, right? You know, uh, we have PCs in our house because some of us in the house use PCs as well. But yeah, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, clearly the kids, it, the kids use PCs. Yeah, because their 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 school gaming. requires it. But <laughs> but the um, it, it's it's I still find it very frustrating. So a pair of spectacles that would act as a screen, paired with my phone, so that I could actually do my work without having to carry a laptop around, uh, or and or video calls, right? So I could you know, find a quiet corner in the office, put my specs on, and join a video call or whatever. That that I would welcome. Because it means I have to carry less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I I have no answer uh, for that. All of like I I travel pretty heavy computer, phones, two iPads, and now a microphone. <laughs> but you're also <laughs> editing 8K video and I, things yeah, like that. I'm, I'm, the, <laughs> So it's all purpose driven, really. You know, I, I, I've traveled just with one iPad with the magic keyboard and for 75, 80 percent of what I needed to do uh, for a week or so or 10 days. Uh, it was absolutely perfect, um, whether it was kind of graphics or computer like kind of things. Yeah. Other things, you know, I need the processing power of a proper computer. And, um, you know, for the most part, I leave the house with a iPhone, which will do uh, a lot more every day. But um, so, so for me, the thing that with those glasses would be the would be the screen, right? Have, being able to use them as a computer screen, right? I think that could be, and and for and by the looks of the design, it would only take up a part of your vision as well. So you'd still be able yeah. to just look through 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 a normal um, lens. And I think that would be really powerful because the, one of the reasons I do need to take a laptop with me when I work is because I need a screen that's bigger than a screen on my phone. Right. Yeah. And so I think something like that could be awesome. All right. Well, I guess we'll sooner or later have things like that and t t things will change until then. I, I'm still happy, very, very happy and dependent on having a proper keyboard to type on yeah, in front of me. That I wouldn't be able to to live without a keyboard. So, so we won't solve the format legacy problems no, today. We won't. But we, won't we, but <laughs> we do invite people to comment or give us ideas on how to protect imagery for all of civilization. And Definitely. we sure hope that we've provoked some thoughts with this episode. This was The Future of Photography. Uh, we're online at thefutureofphotography.com with a whole bunch of episodes. And uh, yeah, we'll be back in about a week, I guess. Until then, everyone, take care and 
have a good Easter. See you then. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. You've been listening to the future of photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. dot